test, test, test. Oh. Okay, I see a problem. I see a problem. Good morning, Janet. Good morning. I'm just finishing the, um, what are the letters behind your name? It's Ace and what else? Huh? What are the letters behind your name? Ace. Yes. Associate Certified Etymologist. Okay, you're Ace, okay. Um, and remind me your position name again? Extension? Program Specialist. All right, grab Timmy real quick. I'm doing the intro, just a real quick intro. Is there anything else you wanted to add for like, um, did you look at the survey questions at all? Yeah, I saw the survey. Are you okay with those or is yeah. there anything that's missing? Nope. I guess it's a pretty good idea of what's going on. All right, let me just finish up here and I will kick it over to you. I think it's going to be good. So let's see, file, save. All right. And Timmy, grab Timmy. Let's see. Do you want to post the webinar? Do you want to post this? Do you want to post this this document on your website? Oh, I can. Okay, what's your website? Um, computer. I still have no internet at the house. Oh, are you serious? Are you working from your hotspot? No, I'm at the office. Oh. Where they are going to put my sidewalk in. What are they going to So in the chat, I put um, the IPM house website. Yeah. All right. Why is my computer not charging? Hold on. <laughs> I don't need it to fall apart. Oh, because it's not plugged in. Now it's charging. All right. You want to go ahead and put the survey in the chat while people are waiting? We'll wait because I'm going to, I'll let them all 
in at 7.55. Oh, great. Okay. New lines. Okay. New lines. The chat to use uh, to ask questions for additional questions and answer during the webinar email education nola.gov. Webinar will be posted at a future date. Will be posted at. Perfect. Anything else we need to say? We're good there. All right, I'm going to grab Timmy real quick. Let's grab it. Tim, you should go get his eight. Good, every, good morning, everybody. We're going to start just in a few minutes. Good morning, everyone. As you're um, signing in, if you would like to also in the chat, put your name so that we have a record that you did attend. And I'll probably ask for that again after um, the mid-morning break. And this is just again to make sure that whatever agency you're trying to get CE credit for, that is either um, Louisiana or Texas registered sanitarians.
We're just going to wait a few more minutes because I know that there are quite a few people that are still um, joining. Just another minute or two. So for all of you joining, I just launched a poll. If you would please also respond. This is great. Thank you, everybody, for taking time to, to answer the questions. This is really great. That, and if you're just joining us, um, for those of you that are just joining, what we're asking is that you place in the chat pod your name so that we have um, a digital record that you attended. Again, we do a poll that we're asking everyone to take as well. Valerie, pretty sure. All right, let's see where we are. Okay, so I think there's a few more people joining. So I think we can get started. The introduction here is gonna be a, a few minutes and uh, that'll give a chance for everybody to join. So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Claudia Regal. I'm the director of the City of New Orleans Mosquito and Termite Control Board. And today we're gonna to be joined by my colleagues, uh, Janet Hurley and also Timmy Mydair. And um, we're gonna be presenting, um, you know, the four hour workshop about rodent control in commercial properties. So what we're, our aim here today is going to really give you a whole lot of background, uh, some ideas, I hope, um, and hopefully just a little bit, a lot more information actually on, on how these animals really can cause a lot of damage um, and even, you know, how to look for them and, and just know that they're even in the area. So um, a couple of things to get started. Um, if you could just please mute your line, that would be super. Um, we're going to have a chance for questions uh, using the chat. And in the background, um, I know we cannot do this without um, a whole team of folks working this workshop. So Mrs. Stacia Carter is in the background monitoring the chat and uh, dealing with our, our problems that we may have. And of course, many of you have also spoken to her by email through registration. So if you have any additional questions that maybe we just didn't answer or you think about it after the webinar, please email education 
at nola.gov and we'll make sure um, to give you the information that you need. Okay. And um, so look, uh, we're offering four hours of CEUs, both for the state of Louisiana and for the state of Texas, uh, but you need to attend the entire workshop. So that we will have a little break here around, uh, I think 10 o'clock, um, but it's very important that you attend the whole workshop so that you can or earn your certificate at the very end. And as Janet mentioned, please put your name in the in the in the um, in the chat so we know uh, that you're attending uh, with us. Okay, we plan to post this uh, webinar with this workshop at uh, www.nola.gov forward slash mosquito. And also Janet's going to put it on her ipmhouse.tamu.edu so that you can refer to it um if you need to in the future so today's speakers of course we've got janet hurley um, at, at texas a m agri life extension um, she got her bachelor's degree in community health from texas women's university and a master's in public affairs from the university of dallas um, she was hired in 2001 at Texas, at texas agri life for the folks in texas you know that she uh, does so much uh, with school IPM. She was a school IPM coordinator, uh, working with all kinds of different public schools. But of course, her responsibilities over the years have expanded. <laughs> and now she's, you know, doing rodent control as well. So we really appreciate all her hard effort and uh, work that she's done um, with your group um, so that we can come together today. Uh, Timmy Midair, he is a um, pest specialist and urban rodentologist. Um, here at the city of New Orleans. And um, he's been working here for a very long time. Um, and also he actually began his career in pest control. So when it comes to pest control, integrated pest management, rodent control, Timmy's the man. Um, he's been able to do so much over the many years. He's known nationally. Um, he uh, works actually quite a bit and speaks at the National uh, Wildlife Control Operators Association, also uh, articles in PCT. Um, you know, and he is one of our regular speakers in the area of road control at the city of New Orleans. Uh, my name is Claudia Regal. I'm the director of the city of New Orleans. I've been uh, working for the city since 2004, before Hurricane Katrina. Been through a lot of different disasters from uh, Hurricane Katrina to uh, even disease epidemics of uh, Zika virus and all kinds of other stuff. So uh, we do quite a bit of uh, rodent work here at the city of New Orleans, and we'd like to share some of that with you today. So just to give you a little bit of um, layout of what the morning is going to look like. Um, so we um, have a busy day, and of course, we're going to talk about rodent biology because I don't care if you're talking about ants or rodents or termites, if you don't know your biology, you're never gonna have a, a chance at control. So those basic fundamental, fundamental uh, pieces of information is very critical. And then also um, Janice gonna be talking about understanding integrated pest management and Timmy is gonna be talking about kitchen inspections, right? So there's a lot of uh, folks that do kitchen inspections here and regulate code. And of course, and we're gonna sort of wrap it up with understanding why rodents are so important uh, to manage and looking at those environmental uh, factors uh, and conditions that you know, contribute to rodent problems to begin with. And then of course, we've got outreach ideas, uh, which is a team effort here at, at the city of New Orleans. And then we'll have a panel to talk um, to everybody. So I'm actually, before I get started, I'm gonna just let uh, Janet jump in uh, for any anything that she would need for the Texas folks, and also um, just to introduce herself. Good morning, everybody. Um, everybody's doing a great job. Just reminder, especially if you um, dialed in with just a phone, we do need your name in that chat so that we can verify you on our sign-in sheet and make sure we get a certificate to you. Um, second of all, welcome everybody. Um, for the remainder of the session, y'all can turn off any video cameras you have. Um, that will help with some folks with making sure that if they've got um, 
trouble joining because of bandwidth issues. Generally, if we um, allow for no videos, that helps. Um, and then finally, um, everybody should be muted. If you have a problem, just put it in the chat. If you've got a question, put it in the chat. Yes, as Claudia said, Dr. Regal said we are recording. So, y'all, play nice. Get ready for lots of education. <laughs> you've got a good um, notepad in front of you. And let's get started, Dr. Regal. All right, thanks so much. And just one quick thing before I get started, I wanna thank so many of you answering these poll questions. These are really important for us. Um, so if you have not responded, please go to the chat real quick um, and answer some of those. And then also we're gonna be putting in a survey. Um, so um, Janet, myself, uh, City of New Orleans, and also University of Miami, we were able to obtain um, a Centers for Disease Control grant. Um, looking at just rodent information, data that's out there. So it's gonna be pretty important for us if you can help us gauge uh, some of this information we have. And then we're also going to be uh, working with the EPA on an education uh, uh, grant and materials, you know, that's really related around rodent control. So as you are listening to this workshop and you have some ideas, that you would like us to focus on, especially for creating some materials for outreach, please put it in the chat, okay? That's gonna be pretty important. There's gonna be an outreach section at the end of this workshop, but you know, it's okay, we'll be monitoring and looking for it. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna move on to today's first topic, which is gonna be anatomy and biology of rodents. So, and as I already said, if you do not understand the basics of anatomy and biology, it's going to be really difficult, right, to do management. As I'm, you know, talking about um, if it's going to be body shape or hearing or, you know, um, pheromones, I'm always thinking about the context of control, always. And so all of this plays a very important role. So let's really start at the very beginning, right? So what does the term, you know, rodent even mean, rodere? It means to gnaw. And rodent is, they're so incredible. So it's in the group uh, order rodentia and is characterized by two uh, growing, two continuously growing incisors. So they have open roots in the upper and the lower jaws. And so they just keep on growing. And I'm gonna address this. There was a question here in the poll and I'm gonna address this here in a minute. But think about this, 40% of mammals are rodents. So they live almost in every type of habitat. They're found in all continents except for Antarctica. Um, and they evolved a long time ago, about 65 million years ago in the Cretaceous period. So they've been around. Now what we're focusing today really are in commensal rodents, right? So these are the, the, the mice and the rats that are, we call it sharing one's table. So they're living amongst us, uh, in our houses, around our houses, and they're, you know, we're providing everything really that they need. And so those three commensal rodents are the house mouse, the Norway rat, and the roof rat. So those are the three that we're really, you know, talking about. And urban mice and rats are just expert at explore, exploiting our resources. So, you know, step number one really is, you know, we've got folks here from Louisiana, we've got folks from Texas and probably other places around the country and even around the world. So I want you to sort of look inward to your own city and say, hey, what species of commensal rodents do I have and where are they? Can you do that, right? So here in New Orleans, fortunately we can do that. And this is a cooperative project with Dr. Mike Blum from the University of uh, uh, Tulane University and now he's at University of Tennessee where it was a four year project uh, really going out and trapping. So we're gonna talk about this later uh, this afternoon, but we have a very good idea of the commensal rodents. We have the Norway rat, we have the roof rat, um, and we also have the house mouse, but we also have some natives here and there. Not many, but at least it gives you some ideas. So the red are the uh, Norway rats, the blue circles, our roof rats and the larger the circle, the larger the population. Of course, this changes over time. 
Um, but you can see that we have quite a bit of areas in New Orleans that are predominantly uh, roof rot, and some of our uh, other areas are combinations of species. So when you look at the house mouse, this is the number one rodent pest really across the world. They're incredibly widespread, um, you know, almost as much as humans here, widespread across the planet. Um, quite small, you can see here, so I just give you a size, um, you know, reference, um, but, you know, they get into everywhere. When you're looking at um, sort of the anatomy um, and morphology, right, of a Norway rat and a roof rat, they're quite different. And so the top here, well, we'll start with the bottom with the roof rat. Um, a little bit more delicate, I would say, but the key feature is that long tail that's longer than the length of the body. So from the base of the tail all the way to the tip of the nose, you can take that tail and actually swing it all the way across and it'll go past its nose. Um, if you look at the Norway rat, so it's a, a bit more of a robust animal. You've got um, more blunt muzzle, smaller ears. You can see that and the tail is going to be shorter. I don't want anybody using color as the point of reference um, because color can actually be quite different. Now, this comes up a lot, right? So this is a great little picture here. Um, and a lot of times people will say, well, I've got these mice. But what they're actually referring to would be a juvenile rat. And actually, there are different ways. And you can tell. It's easy to tell. And, and we're going to talk about uh, paw prints and all kinds of things. So you'll know. But that house mouse is always going to be smaller than that juvenile rat. OK, so um, it is quite small. But this gives you sort of a point of reference uh, what to look for. Now, a question for you guys, right? This is one of the poll questions. So urban rats and mice must gnaw on items so that their teeth do not grow uncontrolled. Well, let's see here. So a lot of people think that's true, but guess what? It's false, right? So it is not true. And I'm gonna show you why. So teeth, yes, they do grow continuously, right? So um, the enamel of the rat's teeth is stronger than copper and aluminum. So that's a real photograph that's after Hurricane Katrina when some rats got into a vending machine. This is down in Plaquemines Parish with the folks from the CDC. But they can't chew through harder metals such as stainless steel and some of these hard metals. So when you're thinking about making recommendations to somebody that you may be inspecting to close a hole, you wanna stick with those very um, uh, tough and, and hard metals. So this is the reason why. Okay, so incisors, um, have hard enamel on the front and a soft dentin on the back. So what happens as they uh, rub together, that dentin wears away, leaving a very sharp edge, all right? So you don't actually, they don't actually need to gnaw on something. I mean, that's their natural behavior, uh, but technically they don't, and it's because of the formation of their mouth. So pretty important too, you can see this word, it's called a diastema. So this is a gap that's in between. And a lot of times these animals will stuff, you know, things into their food uh, or into their diastema and also even their, their little pouches and they're able to move things and food around. So it's really important that if there's a, um, for example, a, a bait station, that the bait is secured. Um, and even if it is, you know, these animals do have the capacity of moving it around. So it's important for those pest control operators or whoever servicing those properties to really keep their eyes on the situation all the time. But the whole point here is the enamel of these rat uh, teeth are incredibly hard. So pretty cool. All right, so here's another question from the poll, right? So rodents can squeeze through small holes because they don't have bones, only cartilage. And so what do we have here? So some folks say true, that's 37%, and then 63% say false. And guess what the answer is? It's false, right? So they actually do have a skeleton. So they're not like sharks, right? Sharks have mostly uh, have cartilage, uh, but no, they, they have bones, but they're incredible acrobats and they are able to move and squeeze. And so the main thing is if they're able to get their skull through, their body is gonna move through that space. And so just a handy way, let's say you're doing an inspection, it's a quarter, a dime, 
which is 35 cents and a number two pencil. So that's what you need to show the, your customers or your, your, you know, the folks that you're inspecting that that's the sizes that they can go through. So a rat um, can go through anything larger than a quarter and a mouse, anything larger than a dime. And so your number two pencil, we use that for gaps and underneath doors. So pretty important. All right, so these animals are incredible when it comes to the sense of touch. You can see that they have vibrisses. So these are those whiskers, those hairs, right? And um, you can see around the muzzle, you can see that along the head, they actually have guard hairs along the top of the body. So very clear here on these photographs, but um, let's say they're whiskers, right? Those vibrissi, each one can wrap around items. They're actually all on an independent nerve. So they can move independently um, and they stretch. They're able to touch that environment before their body uh, reaches it. So very important sensory uh, item, you know, in uh, for rodents. And so again, let's go back a little bit in time, but you've got 1852 with John James Audubon. He was really known for uh, painting animals at their size, actual size, and just incredible detail. And you can see here all of the vibrissi, all of those guard hairs um, that are along the outside on the top of this Norway rat. And did you know that um, clutter is super important, right? So in Norway rats, if those guard hairs hit clutters, thing of things above them, there's just sort of this natural instinct to burrow. So it's really important to keep a clutter-free environment. So just sort of summarizing, you know, touching on the run here. So the vibrissi are on the head, um, as well as the guard hairs to orient the rodent. There are sensory nerves, right, at the base of the hairs. So it's providing information all the time. They're able to run along walls through tall grass, um, those vibrissi are going to be telling the animal what's going on about their environment. And what happens is they're also able to sort of record movements. And so movements through territories are often pre-programmed. And so we really, you know, utilize that information for where we're setting snap traps out or even bait stations, right? So that we want to increase our chances. And we're going to talk more about control later. So they also have very um, keen hearing. So they can hear in the ultrasonic uh, range. Uh, rodent here is from 200 to 80,000 um, hertz, but super important and you'll see these all the time. So there's no data to support that ultrasonic devices have been proven to be effective for rodent control, right? So that's pretty important. We see this on a, this is a common question that we receive all the time. So I did want to touch on that. They also um, have lots of types of vocalization. So rats emit all kinds of sounds, especially when they're stressed. Uh, infants will uh, emit distress, distress sounds. Uh, female laboratory mice and their pheromones can cause male mice to vocalize and even sing, which means really they're recognizable and distinct categories of sound. So you'll also see on some of my slides that I'll have a reference at the bottom. So if you wanna learn more about this topic, that's where you need to go um, to get you more information. Now, very important for communication, right? Our pheromones, and what are pheromones? It's a chemical substance produced and released into the environment by an animal, um, especially mammals or an insect that's affecting behavior or physiology of its uh, other members of the species. So when you see something like this, holy cow. I mean, that tells me so much, right? So for example, Obviously, it's a lot of rat droppings, but it's, it seems to be almost like a communication center, right? You've got two walls on the side, which is great for protection, and rodents are, are going there. Those droppings in urine are going to have tons of pheromones communicating with other members um, saying, well, look, maybe there's food over there, or there's a female in heat over there. There's all kinds of different bits of information uh, that are going to be in that pile. So let's just show you a quick video. Hopefully it'll show. And so look how deliberate, right? That rat, that Nori rat just marked its territory. So that's a pretty incredible uh, video, but that just gives you an idea. And we're gonna talk about disease later, but think about all the pathogens that might be in those little micro droplets, right, uh, of urine. So very important. 
All right, so very, um, let's get to the house mouse. So again, this is one of our um, main rodent uh, pests. Number one, right, originally from Central Asia, transported on ships by merchants and uh, immigrants many hundreds of years ago, and um, very numerous, widespread along uh, around the planet. So when it comes to identification, just to give you a little bit of size perspective, they're about 30 grams. So, you know, it's a few crayons in hand just to give you some perspective. Um, they're large, they've got a semi-naked tail but as long as the head and body together. Again, the fur really can vary. So we don't, you know, the coloration, so we don't love to use that as the indicating factor, but look at those large ears and those large eyes, you know, vibrissy. Um, and very, very nimble and able to move around. Look at those um, little um, digits here that are curling around. And so these are little baby machines as long as there's the resources available, right? So if there's lots of food available, harborage available, um, they'll go into um, production of pups. The gestation period's really short. So we're talking 19, 20 days, they're born pretty much helpless and naked, but it doesn't take very long uh, for them to be weaned and start eating solid food. So with, within maybe five to eight weeks, so we're talking around maybe less than two, two months, um, those youngsters are already reproducing and adding to the population. So um, we're looking at about eight litters in our lifetime maybe. Again, it's all very resource and harborage uh, dependent, while mice typically live around six months, um, it's a pretty short uh, life. It's very, you know, difficult being a, a rodent, um, lots of different uh, dangers. Uh, but some of the captive animals will live much longer. When it comes to behavior um, in cities, it can be, um, look, they can live inside of a building their entire, entire life. In some of these suburban and rural areas, you'll see that um, they will go outside as well. They can move from outside to inside. So that's why those structural openings are really important um, to stay closed, right, and repaired. Um, outdoors, they typically feed on wild seeds and insects, they're omnivores. So they, they really um, can eat quite a lot of things. But if we're providing food, um, scraps, all of that, of course, they're going to exploit that. In cold climates, um, sometimes they move inside as well, basements, um, you know, again, those structural openings are really important. Uh, but they do build nests in walls, in wall voids, uh, furniture we've seen uh, that people keep outside, uh, pretty common locations. So with the Norway rat, um, this is actually taken here in New Orleans, um, underneath a garbage can of all things. And so let's talk a little bit about this animal, pretty important. So Norway rats are originally from the Northern Mongolia area. Um, and again, you know, they exploited boat people that were moving in caravans along the Silk Road, um, and they arrived in the Americas, very likely with the explorers and the settlers, uh, European settlers. They're now found on six continents, uh, numerous Pacific islands, unfortunately, and, and when they are, get on islands, they really can cause so much damage. Um, to the wild bird and local fauna. So there are, are lots of programs that do Norway rat eradication. So um, lots of different names for the Norway rat, right? House rat, wharf rat, sewer rat, brown rat, gray rat. So all different ones. So it's uh, uh, Rattus norvegicus. Um, it was introduced in the US likely in tra uh, trading ships around 1700s, of course. Now it's found uh, in all 50 states. So to identify, these are typically 12 to 16 ounces. So we're really talking less than a pound. I mean, um, a lot of times people will say, these rats are as big as a cat. No, they're not, okay? There's no way that they are. Please bring us a big one if you see it. But our biggest ones have just been a little over a pound and those are typically the you know, pregnant females. And so, but not very common. So your, your fur coarse reddish to grayish brown with sort of a buff whitish belly, but the colors really can vary. We've seen very blonde um, Norway rats. The nose is blunt as I've shown before. Ears are small, sort of close set. The tail is scaly, semi-naked, but very important feature here is shorter than the body and the head length combined. Okay, pretty important. So as I was talking about before, this is a Norway rat. So see how the tail 
does, um, and actually that's Timmy's hand, um, <laughs> had a dead rat. And so the tail doesn't quite reach the nose. If you were to do that with a roof rat, it would far surpass that tip of the nose. Again, also very important here is food and harborage, water, all those things available. If it is, it provides those excellent conditions for reproduction. So, but even then female produces eight to 12 pups or so a litter. Gestation period's very short, 22 days. Um, again, you know, look, pups are weaned from three to four weeks old. So we're talking about a month. And, um, you know, that's a lot of pups that can be produced each year if the conditions are correct. Our goal here is to stress the animals by removing food, water, and harborage. When you do that, reproduction is going to go down. Reproduction capacity, I should say. Um, they're mature, um, usually, what, around 12 weeks or so, and if uh, conditions are, and resources are abundant even sooner than that. Uh, breeding tends to peak in the spring and the fall of the year. Indoors, they're breeding all year long. Uh, wild rats, a lot of dangers for rodents from predation to fighting amongst themselves. Disease, typically six months to a year. Uh, but again, lots of different predators out there um, that are potentially, and then also control measures, right? Uh, from snap trapping to rodenticides, other things that uh, may be done to control rats by the industry. They're very social animals. Um, they live in ground dwellings, right? So these burrows, um, if they're outdoor, and we're gonna show you that in a little bit, but in farms, you can find them in silos and granaries and livestock buildings. They'll, you know, they will nest. We've seen here in New Orleans that they'll nest in um, sort of those uh, vegetative uh, covers of walls, for example. We've seen them nesting in there. So, um, you know, always give it to the rat to figure out where they're going to live. So just make sure that you're really looking at that building holistically in those conditions. Um, they will also live by ponds, lakes, and streams. They feed on all kinds of things like slugs and um, insects and seeds and things like that. So two key factors to a rat's success really is that they're able to tolerate these crowded environments and they are, they can eat almost anything, human or pet, right? So um, they will supplement with wild edibles um, as backup um, and they're really not fussy eaters. And so one of the things we talk about with homeowners all the time is please, you know, don't leave your pet food out, but really also pick up your dog poop because they will eat that as well. So, because it's mostly undigested food. Peak feeding here is very adaptable. It's based on the food source. It's based on the population. It's based on ex human activity. Um, so it really just depends, uh, but uh, they'll eat about uh, one ounce or so of food a day. They prefer foods with high carbs and proteins. Uh, but they will eat fish and meats and fruit and everything else. They kill insects, birds, pigeons sometimes we see, uh, reptiles, lizards, things like that. But they do need clean, fresh water. So, you know, controlling that drip of the AC unit or that hose pipe is really important. So they, they drink about 15 to 30 mils of water per day. So, you know, there's just been a lot of discussion over the many years about territories, but look, they can actually move pretty far, um, about a thousand square feet or so, but, um, you know, if all the resources that they need are local, they'll feed right there um, in that small space. They don't have to go very far. So the whole goal here is, again, stress the environment, remove those things that they need uh, to survive. So they will move um, quite a bit. So we talked about that. Um, they do go through and they re-inspect, they patrol, they mark, as you saw. You know, so we saw that marking with the urine uh, just a little bit ago. So pretty important, uh, but they need that constant water source. So that fountain, that drip, that whatever is providing that water is super important. Rodent signs should be, um, you know, thing, and we're gonna talk about, Timmy's gonna talk about rodent signs and how to look. Uh, but they're going to be pretty frequent in those home ranges. I want to talk a little bit about burrows, and this is with Norway rats. Um, they're typically three holes uh, to a system. They're going to be underground. Sometimes you'll see them under, they like pretty well-drained soil, so sometimes you'll see them in elevated uh, beds or underneath a um, sidewalk, uh, but you basically have the nest, an escape hole, um, or actually two escape holes, so that if they need to get out, they will. Main entrance, 
you've got your burrows underneath their nests, the little chambers, and then you've got two escape holes so that if they need to get out, they will. So this is just a just an extreme example, right? Um, just an incredible uh, system here of burrows. This was just a commercial property area. Fortunately, it's been since remediated, uh, but just incredible activity. Just rats, nori rats all over the place. It was a dumpster right next to it. And um, so really providing a lot of that food source. So unfortunately this is extreme, but fortunately it's been remediated. So just sort of uh, real quick here. So we've got also roof rats. So there are some places in the country that it is Nora rat only. So roof rats are typically uh, found more on that sort of periphery of the US where it's a more temperate climate. These are arboreal you know, uh, animals origin from, originally from South, uh, Southeast Asia those forests, so they're really adapted for climbing and narrow ledges, wires, things like that. And roof rats also found uh, their way to the US through ships, uh, through early settlers of the um, US at that time. But um, places like New York, for example, it is um, Illinois, uh, Chicago, those are areas of just Norway rat only. Um, it is a much colder, uh, harsher climate. Oh, but one quick thing, but it, you go to California, in Arizona, to Phoenix, you know, places like that where the roof rat is the predominant commensal rat. So, um, and then that's a huge challenge. So remember we talked about that long tail, right? Big ears. So here's some examples, some great photographs of that. They're a little bit smaller, sleeker. I think they're more delicate uh, myself, maybe uh, about 12 ounces. So just a little less than a pound. Um, for a really big rat, um, you know, they can be pretty dark um, as well. But again, don't go just by color uh, because it can really change. Their snout's a little bit more pointy. Those ears are really large and they can actually reach over um, to those, um, to the edge of the eye. So you can see that they were wearing gloves. Um, when you're handling any kind of rats, um, you, you need to be experienced. You need to know what you're doing. Um, these are, of course, deceased animals, um, and um, I would not recommend anybody handling a live rat unless you're doing a specific project or, you know, you have the training to do so. So I'm going to show this video because, um, you know, a lot of times people are putting bird food out or pet food, and uh, look at all these uh, roof rats, right? They're coming in, they're, they're selecting those um, high energy very nutritious foods um, that let's say bird food provides. And, you know, we try to do lots of education on this. We'll talk about it here later today. Um, but, you know, we really need to get that point across is that we really cannot have uh, pet food or bird food around properties. Um, you know, it will, it will feed those animals. All right, so very briefly here, um, because uh, Timmy is going to be talking about it, but you really need to understand their different rodent signs. And it you know, comes with experience. If you don't work with rats every single day, um, sometimes we tend to overlook it, right? And um, I know this particular audience is very cued in on different kinds of environmental and you know, pest um, signs uh, because you're doing those inspections. But droppings and tracks and gnaw marks and burrows and runways uh, rub marks and urine stains. And of course, even looking for dead or live rodents are a really good, good sign. When it comes to droppings, again, you know, they produce a lot of droppings and we talked a little bit about it already, but there are lots of different pheromones and pathogens as well that are in these droppings. And so um, quite prolific, and we're gonna show here some photographs here just um, in a minute about the sizes and what they look like. And, you know, everyone needs to understand and know and how to recognize rodent signs and droppings um, because you don't want to get it confused, for example, with an American cockroach dropping or uh, depending on where you are, uh, let's say out west, it may be a chipmunk or um, even geckos. We get questions about that as well. So here's an example, another one, that, a video that Timmy uh, took with his game camera. And, you know, of course, yes, the, those are droppings. And the way I see it is full of pheromones and it is full of pathogens. And it is left, um, you know, as a, as a care package, basically, um, uh, along the way. So really important um, that we teach our customers how to clean this as well. So let's look at sort of the size 
um, and what house mouse droppings look like. There's a dime as a reference and also a grain of rice. So the main thing is you're gonna see a little point here, um, at least on one side, but just to give you a reference on size, you're also looking for fur. And uh, here's a roof rod, a little bit larger. Here's a nickel. Um, again, you typically have one blunt end with one pointed end. Now, you know, this, the color here happens to be pretty light. And depending on what the animal is feeding on, um, you know, the droppings might be different colors. We've had even situations in schools where rats were eating uh, crayons or even candles. And so you get all kinds of different colors. And then of course, very important is if they're eating a rodenticide and you know what the color of the rodenticide is, if it's green or blue or red, um, or even some of these biomarker type um, non-toxicant um, baits, it gives you an idea of what they're feeding on. Um, here's an Oreo rat, again, sort of blunt end, one pointed end, but here's a very important thing, which is a little bit of fur um, that is in that dropping. So very important feature, and you've got a quarter, so you can look and see that it is a little bit larger. Track marks are really important, okay? And um, you need to be able to know the different size of the tracks and what they look like, uh, because that's gonna have, give you a really good idea of um, what animal might be there. And so you're gonna have four digits in the front. This is a, a Norway and you've got five digits in the back. Um, and that's what you're gonna be looking for on your surfaces, on your pipes, um, all over the place, maybe where there's some dust um, this actually happens to even be a fire extinguisher that was um, released, um, some of the material. And so there are some tail drags along with lots of different track marks, pretty important. Gnawing, you know, you just really need to look and gnawing can cause lots of different issues, um, you know, with rodents and also fires as well. Um, so we want to make sure that you, you've got an eye on that as well. There are different sizes. So with the house mouse, you're looking at about two millimeters. This actually happens to be in a snack machine. Uh, and upon closer look, those mice had actually pushed in the cork that was in the back and they were feeding on the food that was inside. And so here are the gnaw marks. Keep your little ruler with you. It'll help you identify what you have. And again, those garbage cans, this isn't a crack. This is a rat's chewing through uh, that had gotten in. And this is a heavy duty plastic that animal, you can see the scratch mark, somehow got in through here and chewed its way out. And rats, nori rats here, four millimeters is what you're looking for with those gnaw marks. Uh, here's a really good example uh, from a bucket um, that it was able to gnaw on. So these are things that you're going to be looking for in your inspections. Uh, burrows, of course, in runs. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more. Timmy's gonna talk more about it. So I'm gonna go quickly here. Uh, but look for those runs and you know, this is a path that is used over and over and over and it's no surprise that it's going to an open garbage can. So this is a pretty old uh, picture actually along the riverfront around the French Quarter and we've been able to work with the French market and folks down there um, in Audubon and this is no more. So they have moved to closed garbage cans and it's really remediated a lot of those problems uh, that are there. It's really a game changer. Here are those burrows that we talked about. And of course, rub marks as well. And so rub marks, this is not just dirt. It looks like, it looks like dirt and soot, but actually it's not. It's um, um, those oils um, that are on that animal. And here's a great example. You can see if you look at the rat closely, um, lots of oils and um, just, you know, that gets rubbed on to surfaces over and over and over. And actually you can check it. And so this is uh, Timmy's uh, initials. And so he took his pocket knife out and he scratched right into it and he could see that it was actually rub marks and not just dirt. And again, look at those lines in your buildings, right? Those structural openings, you can see that dark sooty areas, those are rub marks. So those are areas that rats are current, constantly frequenting. You know, urine stains as well. I mean, these are areas in high infestations, you will see them. Um, unfortunately, so we actually had a bait station in this location. There's a structural opening here as well. And, you know, once we remove the station, you can see um, where that urine uh, stained and as well as those runs that just lots of little micro droplets. And of course, all of you, there's lots of code in the sanitary code here in the state of Louisiana. 
uh, on live and dead rodents being you know, present in kitchens and other uh, locations. So I'm gonna wrap this up here real quick, but look, rats and mice are incredibly complex animals. Um, if you think rodent control is easy, then, then really you don't really know how to do rodent control because it, I find, you know, I've been in this industry for 21 years and rats and mice are tough. I mean, you, they're really challenging. Some populations are incredible. Um, and, you know, they're really, I don't wanna say they're smart because that's not really what it is, but they're really adaptable and really able to figure things out. So, you know, it's very important to really take the time and be Sherlock Holmes, right? And really do a good um, thorough inspection and understand what's there. Uh, rodents are paradomestic, right? So they're in and around our properties. And so they're gonna exploit our resources. So that little crumb that's underneath um, a refrigerator um, it will make a difference. That one apple or that one drain that has cockroaches in it because those animals are gonna eat the cockroaches. Um, and again, in order to really manage rodents and control them, we have to understand their biology and their habits. And their, um, habits. So I am going to um, save your questions, right? You can put them in the chat. I'm gonna um, kick it over here to, I believe Janet is next. I'll have to look on the agenda, um, but I'm gonna go through and look at the chat and answer some of those questions. And then we're also gonna have that uh, question and answer at the very end. Um, and then we'll be able to, um, to get to everything. All right, so it's really mostly for staying on, on time. All right, Janet, I'm gonna kick it over to you. All righty, well, you're, you're off the hook. There's no chats. There's just everybody <laughs> who's signing in, let us know. All right, do we need to give and, a reminder to anybody anymore about attendance and everything else, the poll? No, well, I'm just glad to know that Carolyn really doesn't have a beard. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's because that one came in, I went, okay. Um, All right, so I'm going to kick it back to you. Yes, and Lacey, um, yes, we can make um, the presentations available as well when we post stuff on our websites. But as stated in the beginning, and everybody should know, we are recording. Therefore, um, so you'll be able to see things again. Zoom never be behaves the way you want it to. All right, Janice, uh, getting that up there. Don't forget here, um, please take a few minutes and um, answer our survey if you don't mind. It's very important for us, uh, for our grant and, and getting that information that you need. And um, yeah, so I think you addressed Lacey. Are you ready, Janet? Or still coming up? There she is. Okay, great. Go, just making sure. And Claudia, I did put that survey in the chat, but if you wanna put that again. Oh, great, I'll go ahead and put it in. Okay. All right, good morning, everybody. So now that you know the pests that we're dealing with, let's discuss what you should know about this IPM thing. So to set the stage, especially because of what y'all do, and that has to do with food safety, over the last 10, 15, I can actually say in my career, not just with AgriLife, but in my prior career and my background, foodborne illnesses is one of those things that we all deal with. And that's why we have sanitariums. The interesting thing is, yeah, about 48 million people get sick each year with foodborne illnesses. But what we don't really understand is that, um, 
most of those illnesses, that 70% of foodborne illnesses and more than 50% of those foodborne illnesses come from two categories of food, produce and meat and poultry. And while it comes from produce and meat and poultry, what we don't understand is that there is a linkage to some of our, our pest issues, especially rodents. So a few years ago, Congress passed the Food Safety Modernization, the Foods, yeah, the Food Safety Modernization Act. Say that one five times fast, that responds to our growing problem of having foodborne illnesses. I mean, we've all heard about the E. coli, we've all heard about the salmonella, all of it. And what FISMA says is it gives y'all on the food side, FDA, the authority to do a little bit more when it comes to doing your inspections as far as how are pests influencing the problems. There are seven major rules that are implemented and it all has to do with food production but what's really interesting about most of those rules, and I'll go through those briefly, is that it really ensures that there is safety when it comes to our food supply chain. So the fiscal rules are designated to make clear specific actions must be taken at each of these points to prevent contamination. What this really means is not just rodents, but in the grand scheme of things, so that we can give everybody the same footing, flies, um, mosquitoes, cockroaches, any of those conducive conditions that you see present in any type of food production, food supply area that has the potential for transmitting Salmonella, leptospiriasis, tularemia, listeria, rat bite fever, because those are what rodents transmit. But what about E. coli? What about other things that can be transmitted because of one thing or another? Flies land on one thing, then they go land on something else. There's your wonderful visual. So what does this Food Safety Modernization Act say? It says that this, one of the areas is identifying the hazard. What type of hazard is there in, in the exterior of the property, the interior of the property, out on the food supply area, wherever? Understanding the cause. Okay, why, why are you seeing a filmy um, water leakage down a brick wall inside a structure and it's got green stuff on it. That all means that there's something else going on. Implementing those preventive controls. Again, making sure that you understand that there's ways. So monitoring the effectiveness and then um, reviewing and adjusting as needed. Now, if you look at this, and for those of us in pest control, when I first saw the steps that FDA put in on FISMA, this is mirrors a lot of what we talk about when we talk about integrated pest management. Or for today's program, it's integrated rodent management. Because when we're talking about IPM, we talk about inspections, proper identification, developing a realistic IPM plan, which is taking action. And that does include preventive controls and then education and evaluation because everybody has a role when it comes to rodent management, everyone. So IPM is for everybody. I mean, it's not for the faint of heart, but what it really does require is training. It's teaching people to observe things that are rat-like or pest-like, understanding that attention to detail, looking for those ways that rats can get in, record keeping. We all know that documentation is important, but making sure we document it, 
either with writing stuff down, taking digital images, video, whatever, walking people by their hands, taking actions, that means doing repairs, and then getting other people to work with you. Because what most people don't get is the integrated of this IPM. So environments, anywhere from a typical food establishment to um, a school, a childcare facility, hospitals, nursing homes, clinics, zoos, animal shelters, green spaces, and anywhere else. I mean, your own home can be that as well. In a nutshell, the IPM process, inspect, identification. The reason Dr. Regal went over all that information about mice, Norway rats, and roof rats is while they all somewhat behave similarly, knowing their difference means how do I actually detour them? How do I control them? What can I do quickly to eradicate them? Because that's part of that taking action. If I know what I'm dealing with, then this taking action, it gets a little bit more scientific and that's what we want with this IPM. And then again, finally, that evaluation. And what am I doing, doing correctly? So step one, when we're talking about integrated pest management, we're talking about inspections. And it's the backbone of an IPM program. So the, the Pied Piper of road ecology is Dr. Bobby Corbin. Your three speakers happen to be the pipettes of Dr. Corrigan because he is the, the gentleman that has taught us all that we must train ourselves to see what others don't. We must think like Sherlock Holmes. Claudia said it, and I guarantee you Timmy will say it as well. When you start doing this, you've got to pay attention to those drug bars. That's not does. Openings. Where are they? Extra droppings. And I know that a lot of y'all are sanitarians, but watch for that stuff because now with that FISMA and your health department stuff, you can really think about how you're going to get that client to eliminate those sources so they don't have a problem. Another colleague of ours, Dr. Dean Miller, states that you must assess oh, fix that. the situation before you take action. And what she means is understanding the situation, knowing your surroundings, what's going on. And if you don't know what you're dealing with, it's hard to come up with a long-term solution. Voting management really does require an action plan that can be evaluated and modified as conditions change. You've got to be able to think on the fly. And a lot of your clients may not be able to understand that. And this is where you get to educate them on. Here are some simple things that you can do. Make sure, even when y'all are going out and doing your normal inspections, you've got the right tools. Get a good flashlight. Get one of these mechanic mirrors. They show you things that you would never believe you'd see. A spatula or screwdriver or something like that also works really, really well. Um, if you're really in a lot of tight spaces and stuff, hard hat and um, knee pads also work. Things that you can use, but you can also ask for. So you all have your, your own inspection report, especially here at Sanitary. But when you're also visiting certain clients, especially if it's a school and you're doing their kitchen stuff, look for their pest siding log, look for some type of inspection log from their pest control provider. I mean, those are things that you can ask for as a sanitarian that you can actually utilize when you're trying to document your things as well. Looking where, where others may not, door sweeps are first and foremost. I tell everybody, 
If you look at your index finger, that's a mouse. If you put two fingers together, that's a rat. If I can get either or into a gap under a door, through a wall void, soffit, I'm in. Why do you explain that? This is one of our, our inspections a few years back. But rats what love, love this fault ceiling area because it just allows them to go in and do what they need to do. This is decades ago, but this is Dr. Bobby Core again performing what we, we typically refer to as head down button air, but Bobby here was actually full down body down. It takes that sometimes to inspect because what you will find, just FYI, if you have never done this, I don't because I don't know age-wise how old y'all are online. But if you will look fully down underneath some of this equipment, that is where you will find most of your problems. So on that site assessment. Things that lend itself to rats, ground level openings, utility access points, missing mortar, um, cracked uh, foundations, expansion joints, burrowing, all right? Developing the surrounding areas, who are the neighbors? You know, we talk about construction and stuff in grass, yes, tall grass, tall vegetation, gives, um, especially mice and juveniles, a place to hang out. But again, things change, they're gonna move. Accumulation of rubbish and clutter, oh my gosh. You know, nothing says happiness like a bunch of pallets or tires. Trees and shrubs grow, growing too close to the building. You've got too much vegetation, that's again, another place for them to hide because they don't want predators to find them. Frequency of movement into and out of the facility. Y'all, if it's an abandoned building, just because humans aren't in there does not necessarily mean four-legged, six-legged, and flying creatures will not move in. And then again, proximity to open fields, streams, or highways, especially if you're dealing with doorways. I mean, they're going to use sewer pipes and they're going to use drainage ditches as, as a great way to to move and they will move. They will move yards, feet, miles, depending on what, what's going on, no less. Facility assessment, internal factors. So again, inside a building. Now granted, most of you all are going in and looking just at kitchen areas, the different storage areas. And then we sneak, do they store stuff someplace else? Because unused areas, unused areas like mechanical rooms, that is a great way. And a lot of times how they build a lot of facilities, especially in schools, is they put the mechanical room here, food storage here, and then food prep over here. So you've got water lines and easy access. Um, type of material being held in the facility. Cardboard versus food versus humans versus um, just a warehouse. How many exterior facing doors? How many dock do doors stay open? You know, it, reoccurring problems. One of the things that we talk about is monitoring frequency of movement. Again, break rooms, lockers, raw material and processing sites. Finish good storage, because again, if we're talking food, and then how often is trash collected and disposed of? So, God bless Dr. Regal's team. I, I chatted with, with Tim and said, they've got the best images, but this is, this is the greatest schematic, again, of Mr. Ruth Rat and Mr. Norway Rat. And then this house mouse down here. So you're taking action. You've got whatever your park, your apartment building, your restaurant, your bistro, 
whomever they are, they need to monitor. Monitor can come in, in the form of evidence, can become in the form of cameras, because we're finding with, I mean, you saw it, video, the Claudia's thing, we've been using game cameras, and now with the, the cost coming down on surveillance systems, you know, you can actually look at some of that surveillance stuff to see some great imaging of what's going on. Something to be familiar with, just so that y'all are familiar with, is in the pest control industry, some of these stations are now coming with sensors that can tell the pest control technician of there is activity going on in the station. So when you see a big black box, it may or may not have rodent bait in it, but it may have a little device in there that says, hey, we've got activity going on. Some of the things that Tim's going to talk about is exclusion, trapping, and baiting, and then getting that implementation at client level. But just to understand what we're talking about, when we're talking about those action plans about a rat, because I do what I do for Texas schools, we our schools are required to have these action plans. But this is a simple document that says, hey, if we've got mice, if we've got roof rats, if we've got more rats, these are some of the measures. And some of it, as you can see right here, is sanitation and control measures. That doesn't mean we're going to put out a killing box We have got to do our part to deter those rats. Now, monitoring is, like I said, more than devices. Nothing will get any one of your three speakers today aggravated is all we see is boxes like this ringing a building and nothing else has been done. The vegetation hasn't been addressed. The burrows haven't been addressed. Nothing else because this tells me nothing if I don't know what's really going on. Same time, it should really make y'all mad as sanitarian. You see something like this inside a food handling area, I'd be upset because again, one, the mice shouldn't be this prolific on said food board. Two, what are they not doing to deter these lives from coming in? So like I said, think like a detective and use your senses. Look for those shadows, look for lines, corners, warmth. Mice especially need warmth. So in the summer, it's not that big of a deal, but as the temperature changes, they're going to be looking for places that they can stay warm because they don't have a whole lot of blood to keep them warm. Rats are a little bit better. Holes, I mean, anywhere at ground level all the way to roof level, those sebum trails like Claudia was talking about, those blood marks, and yes, they do stink. There is a distinctive odor of all rodents, no matter how you cut the muscle. Evidence. Yes, they chew wire. Yes, they can come in cracks underneath a bricking area. This is again rug marks. And this is inside a big box store. Oh, yeah, you know, nothing says happiness when you see a dead, or they all make this. I kid you not, most of the time when you see an opening inside a structure, there is the quote unquote Tom and Jerry hole which is the half moon that they literally do. And I love to figure out why. Exclusion. When there is something like this, the client needs to seal it up. If you don't seal it up, they will come right back. And this expanding foam is easy peasy. Remember those teeth that Dr. Lee will show you. Sealants. So this is great if you're trying to, if you've got just a little bit of gap around the frame of a door or a window, and you're trying to seal out small flying insects, small crawling insects, those types of things like that. If it's rodents, sometimes cops aren't the best. Sometimes in silicone will only work for so much. 
But if this was a huge gap and I have seen them where you can stick your hand in it, then you would want something more that has got a hardier sealant to it than just something that they could possibly not be able to put. So something alternative is this is a product called Excluder. It has got um, it's actually grow packs rolled up, mixed together with this other fiber, and you can mesh it around here. The rats and the squirrels don't like this because when they go to chew on it, this is one of the few things that they can't chew through. An alternative, especially if you're talking with housing authorities or something like that, and they don't have a lot of money, you know, using something like this, this copper mesh, that helps. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll do the copper mesh and some type of other sealant to just, again, deterring. If they don't like what they do, you can't get in, then I can't get in. Now you're talking about real heavy deterrent using something like this quarter inch hardware cloth. This is something that really keeps both rats and bats out because I know part of y'all, depending on where you're at within your state of Louisiana and Texas, rats aren't your only headache, but bats can be as well on something that's open like this on a socket. But again, your door sweeps, the excluder actually makes it rubberized and then it also has the fiber within. This is weather stripping. Weather stripping will not deter rats, possibly mice. However, if you're having a problem with door sealing here and here, they, you encourage the client to seal this and this because again, you don't want the rats to follow anything else coming in. We want to stop everything right here at the door. Trash and dumpsters, we could spend days just on these two topics, but again, how close are they to buildings? Do they have the right pots on them? I mean, can things burrow up underneath? This is where you need to invest time, especially if you're looking for a city and you're talking about areas where like Kim Shirt or Claudia Shirt is going to have a The, the burrow holes, yes, that's what I was looking for, y'all. Trapping, just as an FYI for y'all sanitary. This is a live trap, just in case you, and yes, there are those that will live trap rats. I have a gentleman here up in North Texas. He doesn't do anything else but live trap. Of course, he's kind of like Tim. He does like to check them out, do some research, that type of stuff. Most folks use these as snap traps for y'all, especially in a food processing area. These traps can't just be set out. They do need to be in a tamper resistant container. It just might mean that um, controlling said population works slower. But it, these are a very effective devices if deployed correctly. Something that's a little different in 21st century is um, I started playing with these. This is called the Good Nature A24. I use these in areas that there could be a potential problem, mechanical room, that I don't need to put a special bait in it. I don't need to do anything but, oh, just wait for the rat to come up, stick its sniffer up in this chamber. This is a CO2 device. What it does is it literally, as it hits the rat, it plunges it in the back of the neck. It paralyzes it. And then by doing that, when it gets it back here, it's no different than a human. You get it right back here, it, kills, it takes it about a minute and then they're, they're dead. But, and then we can find the body. But what's nice about this device is it's what I call a passive device. 
wouldn't recommend it inside a food area, but one of the places that I have been recommending it just in case would be if I was someplace like a zoo or a museum or someplace where you had live and you didn't want to do something else. Again, nothing else is going to get in here but a rat. So let's talk a little bit about baiting so that y'all understand this is sanitary. For the pest control industry, there's two types of things that we do. One is we use a organicide. It is a registered pesticide with the US EPA, and it is designed to literally kill that rat. That's why it's called a rodenticide. Side means to kill, rodent means what is it actually attacking. Okay, rodent bait, technicians, the pest control industry will say that, but bait can also be non-toxic. They can also be using it as a lure, being, being a food attractant inside one of those snack traps. So when we're talking about non-toxic, we're talking about things like what Dr. Regal was talking about, that detox. Okay, this is a non-toxic rodent thing, but what is mixed in with this is a dye that allows their urine and their feces to glow under black light. And I have seen it because I've used it. Something that is new and revolutionary, and it's just going to take a while for the industry and the rodents to accept it, is these are non-toxic food lures. This is um, all rubber. It's got a smell of anything from like, this one says mango, this one says it smells meat, and yet the meat just smells lovely. Not mango does smell pretty good. But it's designed for them to come and come to the box, gnaw on it, and once I know that I'm gnawing on it, oh, I'm sorry, back up. then what I would do is I would then change my bait and put it in a little bait station. So getting the client to implement isn't always easy. One of the things, again, trash maintenance. Is it a constant problem? Do they have a lot of leakage? Is this where their wound problem is? Is there cracks and stuff that would be ways for them to get into the kitchen? Record keeping. You should be able, as a sanitarian, to be able to look at a document that says somebody's pest control, have their information, what were they putting out, did they find any conducive conditions, and then again, what other notes did they find? At minimum, the EPA requires the name and the address of the place where they were doing the service, name of pest sites and devices used, EPA registration number. Now, traps don't come with that, but the loading they would. Total amount applied, devices used, total number. So they were putting out blue boards, they should have, you know, six blue boards out there. If they were doing something, just FYI, if they were doing some type of liquid application, then they would need to have a mixing rate. Purpose, what, what target pest are they actually going after? The date and time. Service address, if it's different than, say, it's a corporate, and then you're servicing, you know, one of the branches. And then who put it out? The name and license of the person. These are things as sanitarian, you should be able to ask of your licensed applicators. Key elements of reporting. So we require most of our you know, pest control people to have some type of pest siting log with the facility they are servicing. And what that says, so if it's not a siting log, it's a work order system. In other words, if John or Mary um, worker sees something, they should be able to report it because generally when the pest control people are coming in, they may not be there when the staff is there, when the folk not. But again, what goes on? Then having methodical data. 
the hardest part is trying to track what's going on. And Claudia talked talk about the research project that we're working on with CDC and with others. We've got so many in EPA. But part of it is being able to track a problem and then, oh, what do we need to do to fix it? Things that should be reported has found signs of pests, supportive conducive conditions, has entryways, and then unsanctioned pest control pests. Because nothing says happiness when somebody else is trying to do something or does something that doesn't help. So both ITM programs require planning, knowing what is needed for the area involved. Now this, Y'all may not, as sanitarians, have much influence, but this is where we need your help. Because if you're working and if you're in there citing a client, and they and it doesn't matter if it's a rat problem or if it's a roach problem or whatever problem they're having, figuring out the, the general information about the organization. Is it a franchise? Is the owner on property? Who has the right to do what? Are they leasing a building and then do they better get somebody else to come in and do something? That may sound like, wow, that's more than what, what I need to know. But it's, think of it this way. Maybe you are in um, a strict center or one of these other new um, living environments where you've got the, uh, the apartments, and then there's restaurants, and then there's shopping and stuff, that urban area type of thing. Well, who owns the structure? Who fixes what? How do you do what? Because y'all, again, this is basic, but this is where it all goes wrong first. Then assessment of the rodent situation. Pictures, videos, whatever it takes, to, to get everybody on the same page. Organize the steps to implement the plan. Whose role is it? Nothing, and in my 20-year career with, with extension working with schools, nothing upsets me more is, oh, that's not my job, that's so-and-so's job. Look, if, and I do a lot of training for school facility guys, and I said, it'd be a lot nicer if you got five work orders that said, hey, that door sweep's broken, then nobody tells you. And then three months later, well, yeah, that door's been, that door sweep's been like that for ages. Make sure that those things that need fixing get reported. That's where that FISMA comes in. Y'all now have the authority because of that to say to that entity, look, it's not just looking for evidence, I see where you have a potential to have an area that can read something to make a problem for foodborne illnesses. Nail them. Evaluate the program. Make sure that they're following up. I mean, y'all like to eat too. We all know where to eat and where not to eat, right? Just remind them that, you know, this is good business sense. Then we tell the clients again, reassess the program and adjust based on progress changes in the environment. Um, in every interview I've ever done, I will tell you guys, do I ever back off on rats? No. In my own dwelling, you saw that 824 track. That is on my back porch, right by where, you know, it goes from my living room out to where it's supposed to be my peace and enjoyment area. And yet the rats do like to come up and investigate every now and then. And they've been doing that for forever. And it's just seasonality. Rodents are no different than other, than other mammals. They all know where the best place is. It's in their DNA. And finally, remember ITM is a process. It does take time, it takes commitments, and it's a, it takes a team to be successful. This is my full contact information. 
y'all want to take a picture, you want to follow me on Twitter whenever I get back on social media. That all right, thanks, Janet. Sounds good. So, um, are we on schedule? I think we have a break. Yes. I think we're ahead of schedule. Is that true? We, yes, we are ahead. We are way ahead. I know that's good. That, that's good, guys, because I actually, my presentation, my next one's longer. <laughs> so, well, we so do have a good. question. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Is it possible, and Tim, feel free to join in. Is it possible for rodents to nest in one building, such as a storage shed, and then travel outside into a home that is approximately 50 yards away? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, every day. <laughs> every day, all day. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And actually, those sheds in the background, so, uh, so we get a lot. So the city of New Orleans has a 311 system that residents can come in and request a, a service request. And um, a lot of times we actually have people that put, save their, or at least store their pet food or bird seed, um, whatever it is in the back shed. So that often is a problem area because the doors don't close properly. And then another thing is it's above the ground. So that's another place where these animals like to move around. So sheds are actually a, a big deal. So yes, they all day long, like Timmy said. All right, so, okay, so tell you what, everybody, let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break. It is 9.27 now. So let's come back at 9.45, okay? And um, we'll make up your, the time here in presentations uh, down the road uh, today, but let's, uh, Come back, everybody, at 9.45. Thank you. And the poll is in the chat. So thank you, uh, Stacia, put it in there. If you want to take a few minutes and fill it out, that would be super. Thanks. <laughs> 